Um, our second set of speakers today are Robert Zeal and Casey Kesky. Uh, Zeke has long been active in the fire behavior community and completed four assignments this year, two in person and two virtual. Casey Teske, a uh, fire management analyst for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of NIFSI, has had multiple remote LTAN assignments since 2017. This past year, she completed two remote LTAN roles and one on site. Robert and Casey are going to talk about tools that can assist in analyst work. Let's get the presenter role transition to Zeke. Thank you, Wes. Welcome, Zeke. And Casey. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, gotcha. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get my uh, presentation started and swapped here. Uh, so can you see my uh, presentation full screen? I can see it. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning, folks. Uh, I I'm Robert Zeal, fire analyst with the Alaska Fire Science Consortium. I'm here to talk about uh, near real-time satellite imagery and how it might help incident mapping, analysis, planning, uh, and management. The earlier presentation from the NWCG Remote Sensing Data Task Team outlines a formal strategy for use of classified remote sensing products into the future, and I'm glad for the opportunity to follow that presentation. Mine is not a detailed description of satellite technology and utility nor does it lay out a long-term strategy for use of remote sensing information. Instead, I'll try to highlight the value of unclassified near real-time imagery in the mapping and fire analysis processes. At the end, I'll point out some useful websites as well as some learning webinars on Beers imagery and satellite utility that were sponsored by the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. First, the number of satellites orbiting the Earth continues to grow with many new launches planned for a variety of purposes and a variety of instruments on board. I want to talk about a range of products from a collection of the Earth observing satellites that provide near real-time information that fire managers can use. Todd discussed the GO satellite in detail. However, I'll add that, it is temporal, uh, that its temporal resolution can help inform your assessment of wind direction and speed, burn period, and nighttime fire growth. Consider also the utility of the polar orders he'd mentioned, which are at lower heights and allow for higher resolution products. These take two strategies. The MODIS and VIR satellites orbit closer at high speeds as the Earth rotates, allowing them to sense the entire Earth's surface twice a day, twice in a single day. Since there are two of each type, we get some useful information at least eight times a day. And then there are the Sentinel and Landsat satellites that orbit even closer to the Earth than MODIS and VIRS, and their instruments have the highest spatial resolution of all. Most of us here are familiar with the term MODIS or VIRS hotspot, more formally called active fire or AF detections. These are bread and butter fire monitoring tools that allow you to track where the fire is active. It's a compact data set that is accessible in many formats and is displayed on a wide variety of websites and web apps. Clouds can obscure these fire detections, leaving gaps in the record, sometimes when needed most. I found the historic collection of MODIS active fire detections linked to fire scars and dating back to 2002 to be better than the fire occurrence and 209 databases at identifying where and when fires actually burned while active. We have more than 350,000 of these detections in Alaska. Beers AF detections are the new standard as the MODA satellites approach the end of their useful life. These I-band detections are a much higher resolution with about eight I-band detections for every one MODIS hotspot. These Beers satellites include sensing techniques that dramatically reduce the spatial distortion at the edge of the image swath. However, there can be false positive detections like the ones in the red circle here from smoke plumes and other causes that make interpretation of this information somewhat unreliable when reported near real time. One way to compensate for that error is to view unclassified images instead of the interpreted classified products like hotspots and NIROPS interpreted maps. This is a GOES natural color image. 
you can see smoke from the creek fire in the black circle shown on the map. There are a number of both visible and infrared spectral bands sensed from all of these satellites. Using different combinations of these bands as red, green, and blue feeds, images can highlight different characteristics of the Earth and the atmosphere above it. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, this fire color image replaces the visible red band with an infrared band that senses heat at the surface, allowing it to display uh, the, uh, the hottest portions of the fire. While the earlier image shows smoke, this one shows in red colors portions of the Creek Fire perimeter in California that were burning actively on October 18th. This GOES image cannot be zoomed on this site, but it can show the progression of activity over time while playing 24 frames from a 24-hour period. With these many bands of information, images can be produced for a variety of purposes. This fire temperature image uses three infrared bands to highlight heat at the surface. The band assigned red colors can detect wider range of intensity. The band assigned green colors can detect more specifically moderate intensity heat. And the band assigned blue colors can detect primarily very intense heat. Combined as the color you see, the most intense fire has the brightest colors. But as you see, the rest of the image is obscured in darkness, limiting your ability to interpret it. This fear's fire color image, like the earlier GOES image, assigns blue to its normal visible band, green to a near IR veggie band, and the red colors to the IR band that can sense the wide range of fire intensities. As you can see here, the image at 375 meter resolution allows you to see the landscape, the fire scar, the areas that are actively burning, and the smoke plume as it trails away from the fire. These VIRS color images are a workhorse for fire analysts and fire managers in Alaska, where we do not have the resources to regularly fly over our active fires with rotor or fixed wing aircraft. We have fewer incident management teams overseeing our fires and have limited access to many of the products used on fires in the Western US. Instead, we put these images into our map viewers and on printed captures with other important information superimposed for our analysts and managers. With this tool, we know a lot about our fires, their perimeters, and fire activity each day, even for unstaffed fires. Most importantly, I want to point out that these fire color images are available to you in the lower 48 as well. In Southern California, I was monitoring the El Dorado fire with them, using these images to inform updates of burned area, barriers, and ignition inputs. VIRS satellites provide three afternoon views between 1300 and 1500, and three nighttime views between 1 and 3 a.m. NIROPS overflights uh, was in the evening between 20 and 2100. With all that, I had a lot of detailed information throughout the day. I've been on enough fires in the last four years where there was no NIROPS coverage and there was limited access to aircraft for mapping flights. Clearly, from this VIRS image, SIT units and their GIS shops could map from GOFs that could be obtained. And the resolution of the Sentinel-2 image, coming about every five days, provides detail about the current fire scar and the land surrounding it that is unparalleled. Finally, these products are available on several websites and can be useful from them. But our experience in Alaska suggests that they are most useful when they can be brought into our fire management viewers and integrated with other important information. We need current information as the situation changes during the day that these near real time images can help provide. NIROPS and other interpreted products are useful for incident management, but are limited by capacity and timing. Many end users may be comfortable combining KMLs and Google Earth, while GIS users can use much greater detail and flexibility that the geotiffs that can be obtained uh, uh, can provide. More and more though, the ArcGIS online interface is being used to facilitate fire manager use of GIS detail. A map service such as this can, be, can make access for fire managers almost completely transparent. 
Would you like having the latest Veers fire color image of your fire displayable on the situation and analysis maps in WFIS? In closing, I offer these sites for accessing these near real-time unclassified images. The bottom two, Sentinel EO Browser and Real Earth, give users access to a wide variety of products, full zoom control, and downloads as KMLs, GeoTIFFs, and map services. These three webinars on the right would be useful if you want to learn more about these tools and gaining situational awareness from afar. Thank you. Thank you, Zeke. Casey, are you ready? Uh, yes, I am swapping my screen right now. And you should see everything. Is that true? It's up. Take it away. Okay. So thanks, uh, Todd and Zeke, for uh, showing those uh, images and sources for information. I'm going to talk about some other options that I was able to use for situational awareness this summer while I was doing my remote support uh, um, roles. So if you're on site, you can often keep up with the pace and the scale and the urgency of what's happening at an incident. Uh, you can hear the radio chatter. You can see what's happening as all the ops people go running out of the tents or you know whatever it is. You can take a helicopter ride and see where the fire is and, and how it's burning and all those kinds of things. But while you're off site, that's a little bit more difficult. And so I was trying to figure out different ways to keep up with that. So I resorted to some alternative tactics and uh, we'll go over those today. So most of my sources included social media feeds and webcams. Um, whenever I knew that a fire was, that I was gonna be working on, you know, I was gonna get my resource order or whatever, I'd just start looking up on social media sites to try to find that fire. And I'd find out what, of my, what friends of mine were also on that fire. So I could just start gathering information to help me with my situational awareness about that. So in social media, I would think um, lots of the options out there include Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Those are gonna be your big ones. YouTube and LinkedIn are alternative sources, not as common. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some web cameras and private cameras, uh, some of the aircraft that we used, and then things like your friends or uh, news stations. So like I said, the first thing I would do if I knew I was going to a fire is look on the social media sites and I would figure out the hashtags being used. And a hashtag is that pound sign or the tic-tac-toe sign for folks that aren't used to that. I would search online with that hashtag to find out as much as I could about it. So this slide shows a hashtag Cameron Peak Fire and it basically is a, a hashtag is a way to aggregate content. So think of them as a way to connect social media content to a specific topic or event or theme or conversation. So it makes it easier to discover posts around that specific thing. So for example, if you have a fire like Cameron Peak, if you put Cameron Peak or Cameron Peak Fire as a hashtag, then use that across all social media platforms. Anything about Cameron Peak that gets tagged with that hashtag will get um, show up in searches for that. So I worked on Cameron Peak. I also worked on the Sequoia Complex, uh, the Castle Fire and some other various fires in Ca um, California. But you can see here again, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook are pretty common options for getting some information. So once I found those main incident pages on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, I made sure that I liked or followed them. And that allowed me to be notified when new things popped up about that incident that had that hashtag on them. So, for example, I was able to find out when public meetings were going to happen. Uh, I was able to watch operational updates after they posted. Um, and for me, that was really key because in California, I was working multiple fires and I couldn't watch all the same all the meetings at the same time. And so I was able to get information after the meeting just by going back and looking at you know a, an operational update or a public information meeting and then if you're watching these things you can also read the comments and it kind of gives you 
uh, a feel for what the concerns from the community are or other people on the fire or whatever. So these main sites for fires are also a key source of other important information. I was able to hear about spot fires at about the same time that I was able to see them on those satellite feeds that you have just learned about. Um, I was able to determine that evacuations were happening, which to me as a long-term analyst is an indicator that a fire had reached a management action point. And oftentimes that means I needed to do something in terms of modeling. So with this information coming in pretty quickly, um, I can plan ahead based on that information on what I needed to do to be ahead of what the fire people were gonna ask me about. And that was pretty big for me as a remote person um, to keep up with the, the pace and scale of incidents. Um, I was able to see evacuations, like I said, and then you know I wouldn't get concerned if I couldn't get a hold of ops or, or somebody because I knew that everything was happening pretty rapidly and chaos was ensuing. I was also able to use uh, pictures and videos from the field to look at things like fuels and fire behavior and fire effects. And some of that you can't necessarily tell from those satellite feeds. So for me, this was a great tool to see what the column was doing and which way it was going. And after a fire burned through there, what did it like be, look like? Because these were the kinds of questions that we were getting asked. And you know, fire personnel, they're always posting to their private pages. So um, if they're tagging it, then you can see that information. And then again, I was just asking my friends all the time, hey, send me pictures and tell me where you're at. Division Echo, this is 1300 fire behavior. You know, that stuff is super useful. And then again, remote cameras. Um, the alert wildfire system is a huge source of information for me, um, especially in Nevada, uh, Southern Idaho and California. At the bottom left corner, you can see all those blue arrows are locations where a, a camera is. And if you click on them, uh, you can see the view that it sees. So a lot of times, especially in California, you know which cameras to look at for your specific fire. Um, on the Cameron Peak fire, the forest actually had some password protected uh, webcams set up on different lookouts or mountaintops and so I was able to log into those to see what was happening and if the fire had reached certain points or not. Um, the, the biggest issue with this is to just be very cognizant that you're not staying on those sites because they're actually a tool that the forest uses and so you don't want to get your access restricted. And then finally, that multi-mission aircraft that's based out of Colorado was also, uh, there was one that was shared with California. And so I was able to um, use that as a real-time information source as those images were coming in, what those people were seeing, uh, where the hotspots were, you get infrared and visual information. And depending on the fire that you're working and what your connections are, uh, you may be able to get kind of a direct link to the people in the aircraft and let them know what you're looking for. So with that, that's what I have for my presentation. Great, thank you, Casey. Thank you, Zeke, as well. Uh, we'll break now for a 10-minute intermission.